the last session, we're going to look at capability issues, in particular the challenges of modernisation. And this is, as one of the speakers said this morning, this is not planning from a clean sheet. It's about complexity of modernising a force in being. And balancing the need to maintain readiness levels while integrating new and refreshed capabilities. In the time available, it's impossible to cover all the ground. We've therefore chosen to look at lessons learned from, that, from an allies perspective and then pick two what we consider critical capability areas. One which has not attracted much attention yet is an assumed element of modern army, aviation. And the second, a much discussed but really little understood area, integration. Our speakers bring a long and deep knowledge of these issues. Firstly, Lieutenant General uh, John Turlin, Commander Marine Forces Pacific. He'll be followed by Dr Andrew Davies, Director of Research here at ASPE. And thirdly, Dr Mike Ryan, who's the Director of, of the Capability Systems Centre at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. And the open forum will be chaired by Dr Ben Shuri, the uh, Senior Analyst Defence Strategy here at ASPE. Um, I look forward to the session. Could I ask uh, General Tulin to kick it off? Well, thank you very much, Michael. General Campbell, uh, I'm a little nervous being up here with all these doctors, but I guess I'll get, get by it. As you know, the Marines are, uh, have, some Marines are up there training up in Darwin, and uh, you know, they have made, tried to make some cultural adjustments while they've been there. And Doug Pashley was telling me that uh, while he was up in Darwin the other day, he went into a store, was looking for some crocodile shoes, and they were too expensive. So Doug said, well, you, I'm going to go out and get my own croc and make my own shoes. <laughs> to which, when he went out looking, the, the, uh, the owner of the store said, well, when you're out there, you might see a couple of Marines who said the same thing. So he went out and he went and saw the Marines. They were actually in the water, waist deep. And all of a sudden, his croc, a four meter one, came up and a Marine launched on the croc, choked it to death, and then brought, then brought it over to the shore, and Doug heard him say, well, this croc doesn't have any shoes either. <laughs> so, hey, it's a little cultural adjustment we're having here. Well, good morning, I'm uh, Lieutenant General John Toon, as you mentioned, the commander of uh, Mar 4 PAC. And uh, I, I have uh, the honor of uh, actually commanding about uh, two-thirds of the Marine Corps. Uh, on the operational side of the house. So roughly about 80,000 Marines. And uh, I, can show, I can tell you that the Marine Corps shows its commitment to the Pacific simply by the fact that two-thirds of the operational forces are assigned to the Pacific region. And as some of you may know, I have one MEF, which is in California. Uh, and un you know, un unfortunately, there's still that draw on those forces to CENTCOM region. But three MEF is forward deployed in, in this region and uh, they're a very active MEF, and you, you, you see them around here an awful lot. Um, our Marine Corps fills a unique lane in America's armed forces. We are what we call the middleweight force. In other words, we're somewhere between what Special Ops brings and what our Army brothers bring. We provide about 17% of America's active duty ground maneuver brigades, 24% of the ground infantry battalions, 15% of fighter attack squadrons, 21% of attack helicopters. And you can see we, just, we, uh, we, do it, we do it from the sea with our Navy. The Marine Corps has a reputation for providing great value and significant bang for the buck. An expeditionary is not a bumper sticker to us or just a concept. It's a state of conditioning that Marines work hard to maintain. We're not a second land army, but an expeditionary force focused on coming from the sea inherently joint in nature with the integrated aviation and logistics. And we are designed to be mobile, light enough to get to the crisis quickly, to accomplish the mission alone, or provide time for the arrival of additional forces. And we are capable of operating in austere conditions from ships and are self-sustainable with a minimal footprint ashore. The Australians know the Indo-Asia-Pacific region very well and know that as a region geographically defined by water and littoral regions that border the sea. It's an environment Marines are designed, organized, manned, trained, and equipped, and experienced to operate in. Time and distance are real challenges and factors that face both of our militaries. 
and the vastness and maritime nature of the theater requires our forces to be located to respond rapidly when and where required. Now, we maintain our forward presence in the Marine Air Ground Task Forces from our bases in Japan and Korea and Hawaii. And of course, now we have the rotational forces up in Darwin that are, and eventually, we will have our future bases in Guam, Saipan, Tinian, uh, facilities in Tinian and Saipan with bases in Guam, and, and hopefully even start working on amphibious range using the island of Pagan. And we could talk a little bit about how that's going in the Q&A if you'd like. America has and will continue to be a Pacific nation. Our history of working together with Australia and our allies and partners has helped to create and sustain that security. The special relationships we share with Australia is based on trust established through generations of working together and our common values and view of the world. I think that's been a theme throughout today's comments. The geography, demographics, and security challenges of the region point to an operational environment with significant littoral dimension and an environment that we believe is tailor-made for, for marine forces. We face an uncertain world and cannot predict where and when events may occur that might call us to respond. But to meet this need, America has carefully invested over the years and continues to modernize to produce a highly agile, lethal, and responsive core. We are allies and partners to nearly every nation in the region, and the demand is high for our partnered amphibious forces that can bolster, bolster their ability to defend their sovereignty and ensure economic security. To meet this demand, we are increasing our persistent forward presence, rebalancing our force to ensure one-third of the marine operating forces are immediately available, 3 MEF. We are augmenting our forward-based ARG-MU in Japan with additional 90-day sea-based MAGTAF patrols from non-traditional naval platforms and increasing the time transiting the ARG-MU operating in the Indo-Asia Pacific. As many of you may, or many of you probably know, we, the ARG-MU goes through the Pacific out of California and goes into the CENTCOM region. We used to be able to get more days out of them in the Pacific, and we're act active, actively increasing those, those days in the Pacific now. Um, as, you, as, as you reorganize and modernize your forces through Plan Bersheba and Land 400, I believe they should be designed, again, my perspective, to, operate in the maritime, to, to be able to operate in a maritime littoral environment. Um, to me, that means combined arms and amphibious operations. During the inaugural PACOM Amphibious Leader Symposium we hosted last month in Hawaii, I had the pleasure of discussing it with several representatives from Australia. And follow on meetings, of course, since I've been back here the past couple of days. I believe Australia is well on its way to developing these capabilities. The Marine Corps is inherently joint by design and structure. We are manned, organized, and equipped to operate as a self-sustained MAGTAF. In Marine Air Ground Task Force, the aircrafts, the aircraft, the ground units, and their supplies and maintenance work together. And for decades, this combination has proved to be a very effective way to respond to every kind of situation the Marines are required. Our MAGTAFs are scalable and tailor-made tailor to respond rapidly. The MAGTAF structure with its organic aviation is extremely versatile and it operates seamlessly across the air, land, and sea domains with air and artillery supporting ground and mechanized forces. We are also modernizing our force as well. The F-35 will be in Japan by FY-17. Besides being the most capable fifth generation fighter attack aircraft in U.S. inventory, it will provide a major leap forward in joint battle space awareness. Combined with our tilt rotor MV-22, which has proven to be a game changer in the theater and greatly increasing the speed and range with which we can insert Marines. Both are expeditionary aircraft, designed, engineered, built, and operationally tested for all weather operations from Navy amphibious ships. This graphic depicts less intense operations on the left in the green and gradually more intensity to the right side. Depending on the nature of the operation, threat environment, and the scale of the problem, we can right-size our forces to any mission. You'll see a special purpose MAGTAF that we have up there. Uh, you know, that was an outgrowth of, of Benghazi, 
We didn't have anything to respond to, the, to taking down that embassy. It was really an embarrassment for, for our military and for our country. So we created the Special Purpose MAGTAF because we didn't have the ships available to pre-stage Marines in the Mediterranean. But that Special Purpose MAGTAF, with the game-changing Osprey, made the distances not a big deal. And so now, unfortunately, they've done so well that the Special Purpose MAGTAF has become a permanent presence in Europe which detracts from, you know, missions that uh, they have at a 2 map. And, and then, oh, by the way, the CENTCOM commanders saw that that was happening in Europe and said, hey, I want one in CENTCOM, so I had to take it out of one map. And I got a 2,500-man uh, special purpose MAGTAF now sitting in CENTCOM um, responding to whatever desires the CENTCOM commander has. And, but it works. And it's been doing a great job. And because of some of the issues that we've had in Iraq, we've been able to just take that special purpose MACTAP and plug them right into the mission. So they've been their ready forces. From a small... See, when I get off... If I get off focus here, I'm screwed up. <laughs> I, I have this urge to just want to talk to you, but I'm trying to get, make sure I carry all the bases. All right. We are partially and ready to conduct forcible entry for high-end combat operations and to quickly ev uh, evacuate citizens from harm's way during times of crisis. From the Boxing Day tsunami, the great northern Japan earthquake, and the, and the tsunami super typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, to the recent earthquake in Nepal, in the last few years alone, we have conducted numerous humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations throughout the, the Indo Asia Pacific Ring of Fire, saving a lot of lives. And while the world is in shock during time of crisis, be it a natural disaster, terrorist attack, or a conflict, we've been able to mobilize and respond with pretty decisive action. The presence of our forward, if the time comes when we're not ready to deploy and we're not ready to get out of town in six hours with the initial assessment team, then we, we've lost mission. And that's why it's so important. Our forward presence enables us to train regularly together with our partners and allies in the region. Our MAGTAF and amphibious capabilities provide the tools to address the security challenges in the region. And when you consider the statistics on the bottom of this slide regarding our dependence on commerce by sea and populations located near the ocean, it becomes even more apparent that improving our ability to conduct amphib ops together is in all our interest. I think I heard the Secretary say, or excuse me, the Minister, Ministers say that 98%, or maybe it was you, sir, said 98% of your stuff goes through. So why amphibious forces? The geography, demographics, and security challenges, I think, speak for itself. The advantage of operating from the sea are tremendous. The sea becomes maneuver space, which allows us to dictate timing, tempo, and location for applying force. And we can do this at night, day, and in varying weather conditions. Depending on the coastal geography, we have the capability of putting forces ashore from the surface of the sea with connectors, above the sea with helicopters and MV-22s, or, or below the sea with our marine force reconnaissance. Equally important, the sea can serve as our forward operating base, able to maneuver where it needs to project power from or to sustain operations ashore for months on end while reducing footprint. So equipping our ground force for naval operations. The, the MUSE embarked on L-class amphib ships. Somebody used this term earlier, Swiss Army knife. That is our Swiss Army knife, is that those L-class ships. And the same Marine Corps aircraft that provides critical life-saving medical care, food, water, and supplies to survivors during national dis natural disasters can strike targets and deliver firepower and insert Marines during combat ops. Our ships well deck, sustain, and deploy our air cushion land craft and the amphibious assault vehicles for the same purpose. And the ship's command and control communication and intelligence capabilities enable us to rapidly plan as well as host other allied forces. They enable us to bring disaster survivors or non-combatant evacuees back to ship for medical treatment and operate offshore without being a burden assured to the nations we are supporting. And they do all these things around the world. As you can see from the equipment on this slide, the ARGMU possesses significant combat power. 
We are modernizing our capabilities, replacing many of the helicopters with MV-22 Ospreys and our Harriers with F-35Bs. The first, the first MU with, with F-35s will be seaborne in July of 17. These upgrades are, are significant, not only tactically, but also proving to be operational and strategic game changers, shaping how we will operate in the future. Embarking the full capability of the U normally requires three ships, a big deck and two smaller decks. The big deck displaces 45,000 tons and looks like a small aircraft carrier. The small deck displaces up to 25 ton tons and carries a smaller complement of the rotary wing aircraft. We have experimented. There's no set way to load these ships or really, truthfully, to be even deploying them together. If you, many of you probably know that the MU that goes into CENTCOM, one's in Kuwait, one's in, in, the, in the Gulf, and one's in the Suez Canal. They very rarely are working together. But, but because of the distributed nature of, of how the MUs are operating, we're learning more and more about how to make that work better. Our equipment is unique and marinized for sustained operations. Uh, General Brooks and I have been working together and trying to figure out how to best, you know, support Pacific Pathways. And, you know, one of the challenges that he has is that his aircraft is not marinized, and we need to get, we need to, get to fixing that problem, fixing that challenge. But the marinization is not just the corrosion protection. It's water washdown sites. It's sturdier aircraft landing gear, electromagnetic shielding, foldable head headquarter rotor blades, and rotor brakes. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. That's the reason why the Osprey costs $69 million. It's expensive. Our aircraft and ship-to-shore connectors are built for amphibious operations, from engineering design, testing, and operational evaluation. What we have now is the AAV. AAV is old but it's still functional. We're going to keep about 350 of them. We're going to give them to the Marine Expeditionary Units. But we're in the process now of buying 240 amphibious combat vehicles, which are wheeled. I'm an older guy. I, you know, I, I, you're going to have to show me, but I don't believe that track is better than wheeled. But we're buying wheeled, and they tell me the technology is such that it outdoes a track vehicle. I'll, I'll see in his believing. But... We're going to keep AAVs for the MUSE. They will have it for the next 10 years. The ACVs will be used to support other operations from amphibious ships. Eventually, we hope that the physics and science will catch up and that we'll be able to get a tracked vehicle that can travel at 20, 25 knots. Many of you know we wrestled with that with the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle. It was a very expensive bill, research project for us and it didn't work out. So what we learned, we're going to try and apply later on as the physics and other things improve. And to be quite honest, I've been, I've been investigating in other places like Japan. I've been over to Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. They're working on it. Uh, as well as I had a conversation with Admiral uh, Wu, who's uh, the Chinese uh, CNO, and he tells me he's got a vehicle that can move 20 knots. Uh, I'll see it. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, we're not the only nation which recognizes the importance and value uh, of being able to operate from the sea. We've got many nations that are interested, and obviously uh, we're working closely with Australia and Japan, South Korea. Many of these nations have not invested uh, in large amphibious ships, but they're in the process of doing it. And so I think it's going to be important that we continue to maintain a regular exercise schedule where we plug in those opportunities to train together. I'm going to skip the next slide, and I think I'm going to just go to sea basing, modernizing our relationship as well as our equipment. So this photo was taken during a recent PACOM Amphibious Leader Symposium hosted last month. We brought together the military leadership of 24 nations, as I mentioned. And I think the opportunity to work together, particularly as exercises come up in Balakatan, is one that I've, I've mentioned at the Senior Leader Seminar, where we can really press 
ourselves to get the most value out of, our, out of that training opportunity. Um, so by modernizing our mill-to-mill -mill relationships, increasing the participation of like-minded nations in exercise and operations, it will help, will help build a more cooperative multinational security environment in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. I always think that it's a bit of a mixed blessing being in the last session of the day. On the one hand, you're between the audience and the bar, which is never a good place to be. Um, but on the other hand, no one's paying attention and you can get away with a bit more. So um, l l let me see how I go. Uh, I'm actually very grateful to uh, Michael Clifford for suggesting this topic to me today because I haven't had um, really taken the opportunity to think about aviation, Army aviation in its totality before. Uh, although I've had something to say about most of the elements in various places, but when I started to think about what I was going to say today, I realised that I'd pretty much have to do a survey of the various elements of Army aviation, simply because there's no obvious strategic plan for it. In fact, let, let me be blunt, from where I sit, force structure planning and project definition for Army avi aviation looks like a bit of a mess. Now, lest that sound a bit harsh, let me say that most of the elements work okay in practice, and I think the operators are pretty sound, so that it's not a criticism of how Army actually operates its aviation. Um, and let me add that some of the more egregious problems that I see when I look across it weren't actually Army's fault. But I don't see a lot of coherence either. And given that Army spent the period 1999 to 2014 pretty much continuously on operation, the fact that it didn't manage to get its own utility and armed reconnaissance helicopters into theatre in Afghanistan and often had to rely on coalition air support instead suggests that all wasn't what it might have been. So let me start with one of the more problematic areas, which is unfortunately also the most important, and that is Army's primary battlefield helicopters. Both of them were poor choices for different reasons that I'll unpack. Let's start with the MRH-90. That one started as a contender for the replacement of the S-70 Blackhawks at a time when rationalisation was the flavour of the month. The idea behind the rationalisation plan was to reduce the number of types of helicopters in the ADF inventory in order to reduce the overall cost of ownership, with the side benefit of creating an internationally competitive aerospace industry sector around them. Each new type brings with it a set of new fixed costs and a new supply chain, so rationalisation actually made good sense. If Army and Navy could have helicopters with a high degree of commonality and shared supply chains, it would cut down the overall cost and it would be a win for everyone. That's preaching to the choir, as far as I'm concerned. Marginal costs are always preferable to new fixed costs. But let's fast forward now to the present day and we find the Navy is in the process of taking delivery of 24 new Romeo model Seahawk helicopters while the Army continues to uh, operate its Black Hawks while DMO uh, today's still June, yes, there's still a DMO. And the contractor um, continues to work to get the MRH-90s up to speed. Now, I think the MRH-90 will come good in time, and there's been some really good trial work done recently on the new Canberra-class ships, I understand. And when I look at the Army website, it says the MRH-90 is one of the most advanced tactical troop transport helicopters of the 21st century. It can undertake troop transport, search and rescue, special operations and counter-terrorism missions. Amen, brother. Well, that's how the MRH-90 has been sold, but it's not the story that comes through when I talk to people who've actually had close contact with the beast. As I said, it'll get there, um, but it's been proven to be much more of a developmental effort than many expected. And it's also not the helicopter that Army originally recommended to government, to be fair. Alas, and this is often the case when industry policy trumps defence's own requirements, the industry part of the rationalisation plan seems to have taken on a life of its own at the cost of ADF capability, at least in the short term. And there's also a strong preference, I sense, for a different platform than MRH-90 for the counter-terrorism role, either keeping some Black Hawks for that role or moving to something else again, a move that would further diversify the ADF's helicopter fleet. 
That view's been around for as long as I've been paying attention to the issue, and it's a view Army expressed at the time the MRH90 decision was made. In other words, despite considerable investment of time and money, no rationalisation of the helicopter fleet has been achieved. Rather than having a Sea Hawk, Black Hawk mix, or one based on a combination of Airbus land and marine helicopters, we'll have variants of both for the foreseeable future, as well as multiple other helicopter types in the ADF inventory. When the dust has settled, all we've managed to do is retire the Navy Sea Kings and establish a small degree of cross-service commonality with the MRH-90. Now the Tiger. The project delivering it is well over seven years late. That's right, seven years. At the time the decision to acquire it was made, the Apache was in service with American and other forces and ready to go. When we read the National Audit Office report on the Tiger, it tells us the problem was a misclassification of the aircraft as off the shelf when in fact it was developmental and required significant systems integration. It's not alone there, the MRH-90 was also far less mature than believed at the time as well and there are examples in other domains. Just as a digression for a moment, let's pause and contemplate what that means. Billions of taxpayers' dollars were committed without proper appreciation of the technological immaturity of the equipment that was sought. It seems that we were um, either lazy or naive and bought off the brochure rather than doing our basic due diligence. Fortunately, some sterling work from the project team, industry and army has also got Tiger to where the ADF wants it to be. Although now it's an orphan in terms of configuration compared to Tigers elsewhere. When it comes time to upgrade the aircraft, according to the most recent DCP sometime around 2020, we'll have to decide whether to continue to develop our own baseline capability or move in a different direction. Either way, it will be expensive. Lest you think I'm picking on Army here, Navy made this mistake too once when it originally configured its Bravo model Seahawks with systems not found on its American counterparts. The result over time was a steady decline in supportability of the onboard systems and a decline in combat effectiveness. When it came time for the major upgrade, the cost and complexities were in the too hard basket and the effectiveness of the aircraft in anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare became very marginal. Actually, that error was repeated again in the Super Sea Sprite fiasco, only that time around the unique configuration was so hard it didn't even get into service the first time. One thought I'll mention before moving on from Tiger is that while we were still faffing around with ours, the French had theirs in Afghanistan, Libya and Mali flying combat operations. That suggests to me that the problem wasn't so much the airframe as the systems architecture we were trying to fit it into. There's a lot to be said for uniformity of comms and data ar architectures, a point I'll come back to later, and it was really good to hear General McLaughlin on that point earlier today. I'll talk about UAVs for a minute, one area where Army can't actually blame others for missed opportunities. Army, I'd have to say, wasn't especially imaginative or adaptable in its original approach to force development around UAVs. In fact, if it hadn't been for the operational imperatives from Afghanistan, I wonder if Army would still today be trying to frame and meet its requirements for Land 129. For those who came in late, that was quite a saga. It was essentially a case of overreaching ambitions, specifications that couldn't be met, irreconcilable technical problems and eventually project cancellation. In the meantime, in a terrific example of learning by doing, Army got its hands on Scan Eagle and the manned portable Skylark and discovered that you can do a lot with less in the space of UAVs. When the larger and partly contractor-supported Heron was added to the mix, it suddenly looked like a pretty handy suite of UAVs that were well suited to the type of operations Army was being called on to do. What was missing from the mix was an armed UAV that could provide a persistent armed reconnaissance and flying fire support role. All the noises lately suggest that we might not be far off acquiring such a system. And that, I think that makes good sense, but let me just sound a couple of cautions. First, there's a risk that armed drones will become to be seen as an adjunct to Air Force strike capability, and I think that would be a mistake. Australia is not the United States, and I don't think we want to be in the same game. Australian drones, armed drones make most sense as part of Army's CONOPS, regardless of who is operating them. Second, I think it would be a shame if a new fleet of large, long-endurance drones took the focus away from exploring how low-cost, smaller systems can be used effectively. 
On amphibiosity, that's one of the big challenges for Army over the next few years, uh, working out what its amphibious capability will look like and how it's going to work with Navy. Um, it's not so much a force structure problem, so I won't say so much about that, other than to note that if there's one place that a rationalised helicopter force with overlapping logistics would be useful, it would be on a ship. We'll have that to some extent with Navy's MRH-90 utility helicopters alongside armies, but if we want to add ASW helicopters to the mix, there'll be no, no compatibility at all. Okay, that's a lot of what we shouldn't do. Here's, here's what I think we should do. In summary, when I look at Army's aviation force structure, I see a mixture of the good, the not so good, and quite a bit of the time will tell. And it's come together in a bit of a fly-by-the-seat-of-the-pants way and at a painfully slow pace. While most of the key decisions that will shape Army aviation for the next couple of decades have been made, there's still some st coming along. Uh, UAVs in the long-term future of the Tiger come to mind. So it's worth thinking what a strategic plan for Army aviation might look like. I don't think it's too hard, but as always with force structure decisions, it's based on what you want the forces to be able to do. And the Army, and in fact the ADF more, more broadly, needs to be able to do two things well. First, it needs to be connected with the rest of the ADF. Not exactly a tear down the front page conclusion when network-centric and jointry have been catchphrases for decades, but it obviously hasn't been factored highly enough into some decisions, and I'm thinking Tiger in particular there. Uh, as I said, sterling work has things progressing much better now, um, but it certainly wasn't a plug-and-play force element off the shelf. But intra-ADF connectivity, including tactical data links between all of the combat platforms in all of the domains should be a no-brainer. Secondly, Army needs to be able to get into coalition operations and plug into American and NATO compatible networks at the very least. And it needs to be able to take its own aviation along, confident that it can work smoothly with partners. At the risk of provoking inter-service envy, the way Air Force plugged into operations over Iraq recently was seriously impressive. It very much hit the ground running, with both its combat and support elements working well with coalition partners from a very early date. Now, I think there's two broad ways to achieve those goals. One way is to try to develop an open architecture approach to communications and data transfer and make sure that all future platforms meet the specs required for them to work together seamlessly. That will work, but I think it's the hard way, especially if you continue to source major platforms from suppliers on different continents and then try to make them work with a combat management system sourced from somewhere else again. That's only part of the solution. Having platforms that are compatible with the supply chains of partners in theatre is also a real bonus. So having the systems connectivity is good, having the logistics connectivity is better. The easiest way to do that is to source our platforms from the same place so that connectivity and compatibility is pretty much built in. I might be starting to sound a bit like a broken record in my prognostications on these things, but I think there's a lot to be said for sourcing material from the US as a default position. And buying established and mature platforms through foreign military sales works best of all. I have two main reasons for saying that. The first is what happens when we do it. The second is what happens when we don't. Look at the record of FMS Air Force purchases, on time, on budget, and they work when we get them. The FMS Super Hornets were first into Iraq with FMS C-17s flying support, and they didn't miss a beat. Now look at the long and winding road that's been Army's helicopter acquisition and is only now inching towards fit for purpose, except, of course, for the Chinook upgrade, which was, you guessed it, an FMS purchase. But if you want to feel a bit better about Army's helicopter experience, spare a thought for Navy. After the sea sprites, pretty much anything looks good. But there's everything, every reason to think that the Romeo uh, acquisition is tracking nicely, and there's no reason it shouldn't be, given that the bird is already in service in the hundreds with the United States Navy. The only way we could get it wrong would be to fiddle with it and make it an Australian unique orphan. Incidentally, I understand that we tried to do precisely that. We are actually thinking about removing the Hawk Link data system that lets the helicopter exchange data with the surface fleet because we don't have Hawk Link fatted, uh, fitted surface combatants. Of course, the right answer is to make sure that the Navy's future ships all have Hawk Link, um, but having it on our helicopters makes sense in any um, 
uh, make sense in any case if there are American ships around. Thankfully, the Americans and Lockheed Martin seem to have talked us out of that particular error. And that's the final reason, actually, to look at um, the US and FMS as a default position. Anywhere we go beyond the immediate neighbourhood, we're likely to be working with American forces. Being able to plug into their command and control and logistic systems just makes sense and it makes everyone's life easier. So if, and if we keep our kit at the same baseline as American forces, we'll be well ahead in the interoperability stakes. And given that Australia's Air Force and Navy are pretty much on the path of interoperability with the US forces anyway, moving the Army in the same direction would also make for ADF intraoperability. Just so I don't close on a single note, let me observe that there's one thing the Americans don't do especially well, and that's the cheap and cheerful low-end solution to capability. In the unmanned space, especially tactical ISR, there's a lot to be said for keeping requirements down, generation times fast, and experimenting with new ways of doing things with small and cheap systems, where you can afford a lot more of them. I hope that when the ADF moves into the world of operating Triton and something like Reaper, it doesn't mean that the Army loses influence in the UAV space, because there's a lot of scope for good work there. Thank you. The last topic for the day is the integration challenge, which in 20 minutes is a little of a challenge in its um, own right. So if you'll bear with me, tech, uh, integration is always a challenge. It's a technology challenge, it's a system challenge, it's a project challenge, it's a contract challenge, it's a uh, capability development challenge. And what I'd like to do is to discuss it in the latter terms rather than the former. We could talk in excruciating detail if you wish about um, Link 16 incompatibilities, uh, about DODAF frameworks and so on. Um, but there's two reasons for not doing that. And the second one is that the um, capability development area is much more interesting. Um, if you, uh, by way of explanation more than um, by way of gratuitous self-promotion, the Capability Systems Centre is a recent innovation. It's uh, UNSW's uh, first industry centre and we undertake research in just this space, capability development. It's a much under-researched area. It has almost no rigour behind it whatsoever, you'd be surprised to learn. Um, and our first our foundation partner was uh, CTG, so much of the work we do currently is in that space. As I said, while integration um, uh, has always been a challenge, and it's always been a challenge for land systems, it, it has two, two aspects to it, if you like. There's an intra-system and an inter-system aspect. To date, in most armies, to be fair, we've got away with it because the inter-system, um, intra-system uh, integration has largely been handled by the platform developer. And, and it's largely been within their capacity. It's a fairly straightforward thing to do, to stand on shoulders and build platforms that are tightly integrated. Inter-system integration, right since uh, combined um, arms actions in the Second World War, have, have largely also been manageable simply because all we need to do to, is to intercommunicate to allow us to be able to coordinate for command and control. But that's until now, and by now I mean sort of a decade either side of here, because our systems are beginning to struggle uh, to integrate novel uh, subsystems. If you look at an armoured vehicle these days, it, it has what um, Army now has, what Navy has always had in terms of topside system design. We now have to worry about um, not only armour systems, but also half a dozen uh, antennas of different frequencies, half a dozen GPS antennas, and half a dozen uh, ESP type, uh, electronic cell protection type um, antennas as well. That, that process, whilst it's been a steady evolution and it's been fairly obvious for the last 20 years that it's about to break, is about to break. The technology innovations have got to the point where we can no longer solve the problems with technology. As General Gus said before, we, we really can't solve it from here. So in terms of networked and hardened, in both cases they do require to have a transformation in thinking before they can be applied. We really are at our limit in networking simply because to add another little bit of network, we'll have to throw something else out of the vehicle to fit it in. It is relatively straightforward to reach Army's networked aspirations, but it does require a transformation in thinking. It can't be solved from here, and it certainly can't be solved by a linear extrapolation of existing communications and ICT systems. So what that means then is that whilst there are technical and procedural challenges, and let me not belittle them, we're just not going to discuss them here, it's principally a business challenge. But if I can diverge just for a second, that's true of almost every aspect of capability development. 
And in terms of transformations, and I'm sure that you're aware, but there is a very large transformation in capable development on the horizon. So let me talk quickly to that. The issues are about projects, and we all know there's a legion of uh, project failures. In fact, almost every project fails by its own definition. If you look at the top trend reasons why projects fail in almost anyone's lists, and I've just chosen one here, the reasons, ironically, for the last few years, and will proceed to be so, are not in the bailiwick of the project manager, nor the systems engineer, nor, I have to say, the contractor. The reasons are all business failures. Yeah, so if I just highlight them quickly, it's the lack of a valid business case, objectives not being defined properly by the business, the business not lining up its stakeholders and communicating and managing them properly, outcomes not defined in measurable terms by the business, lack of quality control, poor estimation, inappropriate estimation of duration and cost, inadequate governance and insufficient planning and coordination of resources, including salami slicings and budgets and so on. There is little a project manager can do then, and there's little a contractor can do, when stood up by a business with a project which is doomed to fail from the bat. So in the last few years we've been working very hard in the international space, and some of you might know that there's been a recent release of 15288, the premier standard in the space, and, and that was released a couple of weeks ago. We've just recently injected, after lots and lots of angst, another layer in the process. You might not be surprised to say, see, it's called the business analysis and mission analysis process. From a defence point of view, these things are fundamental. It makes absolutely no sense to embark on an operation that didn't start with some commander's intent and wasn't then decomposed into a series of mission statements at lower and lower levels until finally it was implemented. In most uh, development of, of projects in all spaces, not just defence, but also in the commercial space, it normally starts with stakeholders who write themselves a list of things what they would like, which is probably the most inappropriate way to start a project. So the layer now insists that the, the business lines up the project before it starts. It lines up the stakeholders, it lines up the funding, and it, more importantly, it lines up the requirements, that the business needs and the business requirements are formal documents that are signed off by the enterprise before the acquisition even begins to be developed. Let me pause it there and I'll come back to it. Um, if you'll bear with me for a second, I just want to show you a bit of Systems 101. There's a big distinction, and in fact, we make a lot of mistakes. Our language is very, very poor. This is a system. Yeah? So a system has a set of interconnecting elements that are bounded in some way, and the system has a common purpose. In defence, we call it a mission. That boundary is very important to us because in project management and in projects, we call it scope. And it's that that sets then the project budget. If we uh, look at the system then in its context, all of our systems are open and obviously um, operate in a much wider environment, then we have interfaces to the environment and we have a broader set of systems within which the system exists, and then we have a wider environment and a wider environment still, and it can go as far as you'd like. That boundary then is equally more important because we could actually set it pretty well anywhere. And if we're not careful, the word system becomes what it already is, I think, the most overused word in the English language. You could simply replace it with stuff and get just as meaningful content. It gets even worse then because sometimes that system of interest that we focus on, we call a system of systems. That is, if the system elements are systems in their own right, we call it system of systems. We have to be careful about that because if we're not careful, it'll become stuff of stuff. And largely when we use the term, what we mean is complicated stuff. So, for example, we call a submarine a system of systems. It isn't. It's a system. To deny that and to call it something else then means we, we actually end up designing it inappropriately. You can see the reason for confusion, though, because the two are identically, uh, identical in an architectural sense. You can see that they, because they're defined in the same way. They're a thing what has elements. A system, though, is noticeably different. The elements are subsystems. The subsystems are tightly integrated by the system designer. Their purpose is to serve only the system. They only have the mission of serving the system. They never leave the system and they're not optimised. They're suboptimal because the system is optimised. And so those subsystem combinations are there so that the system is optimised. The system is managerially and operationally independent. It can go and do as it will, well within the road rules, within the air traffic control rules and so on. If you move over to a system of systems, you'll see there's a considerable difference. Remember now the system elements are independent. And so the system of systems designer has a very loose coupling, not the tight coupling in a system, between systems. Systems are independent, they have their own mission. They can leave and depart at will. 
And so a system of systems is quite markedly different from a system. A submarine is a system. Notice also that when we design the system of systems, we have to firstly design the system for its own purpose and then figure out how it fits into the larger purpose, or else the submarine would be designed to always be on the surface so that we could talk to it. The big difference, therefore, is that a system is an integration, yes, but of codependent systems that were designed at the time the system was designed and always stay on that system permanently and do nothing other than serve that system. A system of systems is an integration, but it's of, code, of course, independent systems that can leave and depart at will, and that is the system of systems exists for only a short period of time. But you'll notice that defence is, is implicitly always had such an idea, right? We call these things force element groups or some other language. We design them in two completely different ways. If we get that confused, and we do, then we end up with quite a confused structure. So, for example, in an appropriate design process, then, there would be a hierarchy of system of systems. If we start at the top, there would be systems of systems that suit the ADO's purpose, for example, with some systems spawned off for the various elements. There would be systems of systems that come down to the warfighting level in the ADF, and they would naturally then suit, perhaps, the domains. If I take the senior domain, then they, that would spawn an SOS for maritime air, maritime surface and maritime subsurface and then we would continue to decompose those to lower and lower levels. If you take the land domain, then down at the bottom is the main battle tank. That system sits, though, in the context of the systems of systems within which it might operate. It's defined, in fact, by those systems of systems, not by the tank itself. So what we do then when we design such systems, or rather what we ought to do, is have the notion of integrating OCDs. We've always had such a notion, we've called them umbrella OCDs in the past, but we call them OCD, integrating OCDs at the moment. They're actually fundamental. Firstly, in an accountability sense, because if we want to go from the white paper to the tank, we have to go through the intellectual discussion of what systems of systems sit above that tank to justify the tank. If we look at the OCD for the tank then, much of what the tank is, is defined by the system of system layers that sit above it. So in what CBRE environment does it need to exist? What self-protection does it need to have? What EW suites does it need to carry? What data links does it need to communicate excuse me, to and so on? And so the integrating OCD is a very important part of system design. So they always have latently been there, but um, fortunately they've been resurrected over the last few years by General John Caligari. And I don't know if you've seen the, the IOCDs that have been published by CDG. But as you might imagine, there are OCDs that cover the domains in terms of maritime land, air and so on. There are cross-domain functions like command and control, communications, battle space awareness, fires, effects, manoeuvre, logistics, etc. And there are, of course, the what you might call glue programs. So you've got um, electronic warfare, geospatial, amphibious, simulation, programs that are programs in their own right, but they serve no purpose other than provide the framework within which other programs might sit. So, the integration challenge. The integration challenge is that we can't test integration in. We have tried in a number of ways to do that, and we had interoperability labs, for example, that used to tell us whether or not things were interoperable after we'd purchased them, by which time it's too late. The design has to be complete before the contract's struck. Integration can only be designed in if integration has been defined at the higher level, not the system level. It's, an, it's a higher level function, not a system level function. The higher levels of the integrating OCDs are a business function, not a system designer function, not a contractor function. And so the integration challenge then, as with other project challenges, which is why I started that way, is fundamentally a business challenge. Not a technology challenge, not a system challenge, not a contractor challenge, not a project challenge, nor even an acquirer challenge. Yes, they all have roles to play, but if they do their job perfectly, it'll still fail unless the business has defined integration before it starts. But then we know how to address both integration... Oops. We know how to address integration um, as well as projects. This is from data taken from NASA uh, from a series of uh, longitudinal studies over small projects, large projects, technology-based, software, hardware, high-risk, low-risk. Defence has its own data um, um, taken some several, several, a couple of decades ago, if I remember correctly. And what it says quite comprehensively is that if you expend the industry average of 2 to 3 per cent of your total project cost before you go to contract, you'll overrun by 80 to 200 per cent. 
If you spend 8 to 14 per cent, you'll come in on time or at least 50 per cent over budget every time. And so the lessons then really are a smart buyer would expend 15 per cent of total project cost before going to contract. The capability development documents are written not for the system, but in the context of the systems of systems. And so there are OCD documents, if you like, or CDD documents at each of those layers. That the CDD documents themselves are not linear sequential staff college essays with quotes from Clausewitz and clip art. They are design documents. They ought to be written by designers. The people who write the documents should be appropriately trained. Um, there must be a system design review before going to contract. We have a seriously very large number of gate reviews for project managements after the event, but to be fair, no design reviews. There is no uh, analysis, independent or otherwise, of the design veracity of an FPS which goes to tender. In a fixed price contractor, in fixed price contract, the problem is that once we've signed that fixed price contract, the contractor has little, little that can be done to fix any errors that exist in the contracted document, which is the system spec. We can make the contract of the design authority all we like, but we wrote the system spec. We are the system designer. So, regardless of what the business does or says, the business is always responsible for the problem and remains responsible from the signing of the contract to the receiving of it in service to the taking it out in retirement and, and therefore needs to be appropriately qualified. There's a revolution out there. The revolution in here with the first principles review is yet to be resolved. But one would hope we don't throw away a very large number of lessons that we've learnt in capability development. It isn't a trivial process. The smart buyer can't get smarter by giving the problem to somebody else. You're then a dumb customer. To be a smart customer, you have to get smart. And that's one of the interesting things that we see what will happen in the next little while. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to all three gentlemen um, for the excellent presentations and for, for keeping in time. Um, we now have 35 minutes, um, which you need to use to earn your seat at the dinner table by asking pointed questions. Um, and I would like to uh, shamelessly use my role as a moderator to ask a first question uh, to, to General Tool, and, and it's a fairly easy one, I, I think. Um, I think if we're talking about amphibious operations in the Western Pacific, I mean, there is this one big elephant in the room, which is China. Um, and China, as we know, um, is changing the threat environment in a way that the discussion, at least to me, it seems, in the U.S. Marine Corps is that it will push even the U.S. Marine Corps further out to sea. And you talked about the connectors and new ways of... Um, projecting um, amphibious force in this threat environment. So my question is twofold. First one, how do you project amphibious power to strategic effect against an adversary such as China? And secondly, related to that, how do you include allies whose capabilities and experience in amphibious operations, as you alluded to, are so much more limited effectively in any such operation or is this simply not something um, which is which is feasible thank you we uh, we had a discussion at the senior leader seminar we had trilaterals with uh, Australia Jap Japan and the United States and uh, that was the elephant in the room then as well uh, <clears throat> um, two-part question I think the first part is that from a uh, strategic viewpoint, um, the relationship that we have with uh, the PRC is pretty well guided from the United States perspective by the National Defense Authorization Act, which limits activities that we can conduct with our, our Chinese friends. Um, so th there is some built in tension there. For example, when we had the uh, PACOM Amphibious Leadership Symposium, uh, we couldn't invite them because it was, we were talking about force, protect, force projection. But we do think that there's opportunities to engage. 
And uh, for example, um, the Chinese are very interested in how we conduct non-combatant evacuations. From their experience in uh, Libya, they, they realized that they had, there was some coordination that could have been done better. And so they asked, could we work on uh, an exercise or bring an organism, a MU through and conduct the non-combatant evacuation training. So, so we're restricted on what we can do in some cases, but in other cases there are some opportunities to engage. And I think we should try and strive for both. In regards to uh, working with uh, our allies, and, and I think, as I mentioned in my comments, remarks, there are some exercises that are coming up that I think will be very uh, beneficial to uh, working out amphibious operations with um, the, the Japanese. Uh, we could, we could, uh, we're looking at a scenario in the Philippines where the Western um, command in Palawan would have an opportunity to conduct some training, uh, some planning on uh, counter lodgement operations. Uh, as well as uh, we think that we can get our, our, our Navy to uh, conduct uh, operations as well on the West Philippine Sea. So um, we would like to invite some of the nations to uh, work with that staff in West Mincom to take a look at how we would plan account lodgement operations. So there are some opportunities. Um, RIMPAC is coming up. I think that's another one. And that's actually a case where I think uh, China may be invited. So hopefully I, I answered that question. It's a tough one. Uh, there's a lot of constraints, but we're looking for opportunities to engage as well as for opportunities to practice and rehearse amphib operations. Uh, thank you, General. So the floor is open. Uh uh, gentlemen, my question is for General Toolan. Uh, Sir Murray Thompson from Army Headquarters. I'm just interested in your thoughts on how our Army might build a, uh, and sustain a competent amphibious force? I think, I think you know, to be honest, uh, they're well on their way. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we had back in the early 70s is that our services didn't really cooperate very well. And uh, we had to have our Congress kind of dictate and say, hey, we're going to put together this legislation that's going to mandate that you work better together. I think the biggest challenge with amphibious operations is really getting those services to fully cooperate. Because it is a challenge. I mean, every, every service has got their own issues that they've got to deal with. And now we've got to kind of sort of share. And it's difficult. Uh, the Marine Corps, I mean, as I mentioned in my speech, my, my remarks, you know, I said we we're pretty cheap, for, we pretty, pretty good bang for the buck on the Navy, on the, on the dollar that's being spent. But the real, reality is we're spending a lot of Navy money, too. Uh, you know, first of all, all our airplanes being paid for by the Navy. Uh, and so that's a big chunk of money. And they, they have to wrestle with submarine flight hours. But that's what has to happen, that the, the services need to cooperate and coordinate in a, in a, in a better fashion, and it's going to take time. And it's obviously... As I mentioned, it took our Congress to legislate things for us to really make it happen. Um, and so I see in the white, you know, potential white paper coming out soon, there's going to be some things in that. The, net, the Japanese are dealing with their defense guidelines. There's going to be things in that that are going to mandate closer coordination. So I think that's going to be the catalyst. I have one then uh, from Mick Ryan. Um, my head is still buzzing from all the systems of systems. Um, it's probably due to my limited um, cognitive ability. Um, did I get, understand you correctly that integration is almost systemically almost bound to fail? And are there any other examples of how other Western countries with which we are closely cooperating or might be in the future are doing these things differently, or is this just sort of, well, a systemic problem? Um, I'm not sure that it follows that, that um, integration leads to bound to fail, except the fact that there isn't a, isn't a system which isn't integrated. It's, by definition, 
about integration. And so um, since most systems fail in their procurement, I guess you could argue that integration is bound to fail, but not for that reason. I think integration is something that, that is that needs to stay within the bound of the system design. And what I was trying to say was that, that it is part of a systems design and it's part of a system of systems design. But the systems design can't bite until the system of systems design has been complete. So the SOS design isn't just a, a word that means a big complex system. It is actually a system, it's a capability, and it has to be designed by the business. And once the business has finished that design and, and articulated why, why it has something. So for example, when we write no CD currently, we write sections one to three, which are written by the stakeholders to justify why the thing should exist. They should never write that document. It should be in the higher level document that tells them to go and buy one. And if the frigate needs to be replaced because the higher level SOS says so, then it becomes a frigate replacement project. It doesn't justify itself, it's replacing the frigate. And the same with the main battle tank or whatever other capability. Since most of those capabilities are extant in warfare, then they become replacement projects, maybe upgrade projects or so on. To spend an enormous amount of detail um, trying to uh, redesign the system again and re-justify it is, is a lot of wasted effort. And then not to put any design into it, but just simply write it as an essay is also then wasteful. So, it, so you have to argue that, that the integration doesn't always happen at the higher level. Um, and then whilst it does happen at the lower level, it doesn't bite because it's absent the higher level. I think it's fair to say, though, that there are places that do it better than, other than, rather than others, but it is something which is quite poorly done. If you look from construction and production backwards, the process becomes looser and looser and looser and looser. So we have really tight manufacturing processes, we have really tight engineering processes, we have really tight system level designs. But when you get back up into the business space, we just wave our hands at it and expect it to magically appear. And I think we're at that point in time where that can't happen anymore. The owner of the system has to become very aware of what the system is, how it fits into their business, and describe the system properly. And I think you'll be able to find that any failure you could ever point to will come back to exactly that problem. It's not a contractor problem, despite the fact we love to blame them and cane them. It's largely a failure of business, because the contractor was set up to fail. Okay. Peter. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to ask the panellists about what are your recommended steps for making army in this case, or defence if you prefer, a smarter customer when it comes to designing the capabilities that, it, that it's looking for? The First Principles Review puts a lot of emphasis on the idea of challenge as being um, a, a means to arrive at a, at a sort of a better way of developing capability. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, Andrew and Mike perhaps offering their thoughts. We've, we've got the critique of, of um, current practice, but you know, what are the steps towards um, giving us that, that smarter customer capability? And then from uh, General Tulin's perspective, well, how, does, how, does, um, how do the Marines effectively do this? What, what is it in your perspective, General, that makes the Marines a smart customer when it comes to defining what capabilities they want to have? Thanks for your question, Peter. Um, well, I think you just heard part of the, the solution from Mike just um, previously there, and that is at the requirements in the business case phase, you need to get it right and you need to apply some precision, not, not just wave your hands and say, oh, we, we want a 40-tonne tank that can also take off vertically, um, but to actually get some engineering into the process right at the start. And if you can't do that, if you can't be a smart buyer, who understands the, the trade-offs that you're going to have to make, get out of the space of trying to define requirements and just go buy something that works. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, for me that's the, the, it's a systemic problem, but I don't, th I don't think uh, society's yet recognised that we're setting ourselves problems we can't solve. Not that we don't have the technologies to solve, but we don't have the business processes to, to establish the set of requirements in the first place. And I think um, it's no accident when you look around the world, the strongest uh, industries are run by uh, technologists with financial advice, not accountants with technology advice. And I think it's always fundamental, and I mean, I'm talking to the converted, right? If you don't know your business, you're a terrible commander. If, you've not, if you don't understand the, 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 the ship's company, you're not a good captain of a ship. If you've never been in a division, you can't be a divisional commander. I think if you follow that logic through, you can't buy stuff if you've never bought stuff before. 
and to suddenly turn up and be in a choir is, is a difficult thing. Army's very lucky. I mean, there are now close to 600 technical qualified staff officers put through CTMC. They are all very capable people and trained so. 12 months of focusing on such things and they, they provide a great base upon which to build. I think for me the business just has to recognise that, that, that regardless of how hard they work, if they're pointed in the wrong direction they'll arrive at the wrong place, on time, on budget. And, and we've got to point them in the right direction and then it'll work. It's a business issue, not, not, not a technology issue, not a, not a capability issue, not an acquirer issue. And to hand that off and give it to an acquirer and say, here you go, here's a bucket of money, here's about six need statements, you go and buy it for me, is just wrong. The, the business has to own it and drive it, and when they do, it works. Can I just add one footnote that, to that about being a smart customer? Some of the examples I gave, it was clearly the case that the Commonwealth was not a smart customer. We signed up to something that was not what we thought it was. We signed up to something that was actually a developmental issue that we, we thought we were, were buying a complete solution, which again suggests that that smartness at the very start of the system just wasn't there. It's a uh, tough question, but I think um, one of the challenges we have is we very rarely get the threat, the next war, right. Uh, as much analysis and vision we apply, if you look at history, we've never really hit it on the nail on the head. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go design a plan. And I think the vision that the Marine Corps is evolving as far as what things will look like in 2030 is, is a way to start back planning. And if we do it smartly, and we, you know, look at the threat and do our very best, uh, I think maybe we'll start purchasing the kind of equipment that we really need. It's amazing. When you look at Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, the number of MRAPs that we purchased that we didn't even have a clue we were going to need them. I mean, they just came, you know, industry just turned over and manufactured them. And some of the body armor that we've given our Marines, things that just came on board because we learned the hard way. Um, that's not being a smart customer. So there's no rest for us. So therefore, what question should we be asking government to approve? If the design, if, if in the, in the um, uh, if we're not getting the integration question right, or the, or, or the process right, what question should we ask government to approve? Because if you look, if I pick up on um, Andrew's comment about helicopters, um, Army knew exactly what it wanted. Um, someone else made the decision that they didn't like that outcome, and they went the other way, and what have we got? So I think, I think the issue is what, yeah, for me it's interesting, what, what should government agree to? What are they actually signing up to? Yeah, well, so I think, um, to be frank, in that respect, in my 30 years in the process, we've gone a little backwards. I mean, when I first started work, the Chief of Army had, had in front of him his Chief of Logistics, his Chief of Material, his Chief of Operations, and they sat with their, with their bucket of money and allocated it proportionately and, and, and focused on what they wanted to support their needs. But the process of jointising it, which is a very useful process, I'm not meaning to criticise it, I'm just saying it sort of starts to dissipate. And if you look at successive audit office reports, I mean, very few of them can actually point to who owns the business. And so that for me, it's, it's really who is the business owner, who has the responsibility, who has the accountability. And then I think that person has to be allowed to do what they want to do for their purpose. And I don't think they should have to be enforced to write some specification just to, to fill some template to say that they're talking about some functional terms, what they want, when what they want is that platform. And they're our most successful projects where we name the platform. Um, the idea that we would um, uh, fuzzy it up just so we can, I don't know why, but th is not a good thing. So I think the, the, for me, the, the, the idea would be to, to be more careful about who it was that had the right to say what they wanted and then, and then to accept that right and to implement it. And if it means that we have to buy it off the shelf, then we should do that more often. Andrew, you want to? Yeah, I, I was going to say that the... Um in, in terms of government decision making, I hope I was sufficiently clear that I don't blame Army for the decision for the MRH90. It was pretty clear that Army were headed towards something that was more off the shelf. But I think the, the audit office report on MRH90 
it is an absolutely revealing read because one of the things they do, which is rare for the audit office, is they actually have um, cabinet papers in there. So you can see what cabinet was told. And it was a combination of two things. It was a clear preference for the other solution, um, mixed up with a bunch of really poor quality um, data that, that was so poor quality, it gave enough wiggle room to make the other decision um, on the basis of industry advantage. So the, the, the real problem there was not what government was being asked to decide, it was the fact that they were given a poor quality data package. And, sorry, can I also add that, that, that to me too there's a certain naivety in the process. It's not, it's not something that we're good at and so, so I think we're setting ourselves com complex problems we can't solve at that, at that level. And so um, there's a classic example recently, if, um, if you go to Holden and ask them to build you a vehicle, you can almost guarantee they deliver us 100 vehicles on the day to the dollar with, with whatever we wanted to. Um, a, a company similar to that, Chevy, just did the Chevy Volt. And they just changed one small aspect of the vehicle and made it an electric vehicle. But same passenger cabin, same fit out, same pretty well. It overran by a factor of two in the manufacturing process. So their estimates as a car manufacturer were wildly out for their own car, things that thing they knew and loved dearly. And so I'm willing to bet you a million dollars I haven't looked, but they'll be bringing Chevy Volt, which is now in production, in on time, on budget, to the nearest cent every time. So what's the difference? A car company gets ex it's extended slightly out of its domain and its margins are way out. So if you tell me that it costs a billion dollars to buy a vessel and it's in, it's in production and we're going to build it here, then that's not an estimate of how much it's going to cost here. If we say we're going to buy the hull and put our platform on it and put this on it and put this on it, I'll tell you to quadruple it and you might be close. The idea that we're surprised it wasn't the original estimate is a failure of estimates, not a failure of projects. So most projects are estimation failures, not project failures. And so it's, it's naive, I think, quite, um, it may not be the right word, but it's naive at the business level and up because the business doesn't really understand the implication of the technology. It's too complex for them to now be across and we can't give good estimates. The, the, uh, yet another footnote from me um, is that this is a space where the old saying that um, better is the enemy of good enough really applies too. Because I think when, when government is given decisions to make, and I think in this case the, the services are a little bit culpable as well, if there's a system with a performance that's 90% and a system with a performance that's 99%, the inclination will always be to go to the one with the higher performance without factoring in the, uh, the very simple fact that time is money and getting that extra 9% of performance will cost you more in terms of dollars, but especially in terms of time. And there's plenty of ADF capability procurements where we've chased the higher level of capability and then waited an extra decade for it. Jim Molan, a, a, a retired army officer. Um, it's a follow-up question from Mike's question, really, and that is uh, uh, for Mike Ryan. Do you have any confidence that the first principles review will lead us in a way, either in the, the theory that it is now or, or the implementation, that the first principle review will lead us in a way that we can do this any better at all? <laughs> uh, well, as, as, an ex, as an ex person involved in intelligence for most of his career, I can tell you the scariest thing is the complete absence of information. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I think the first principles review, you have to get 100% behind for, philosophically for what's been shown. So um, part of Mike's question was that the gate zero review was an absolutely you know, great leap forward to, to force there to be some business statement uh, rather than a, an entry in a DCP. That's a really good thing. What happens next, though, is the thing that's most interesting. So it's what's going to happen in implementation review. I, I referred to the business because, well, who knows who that is? I mean, um, I would be talking about CDG, but post first principles, who is that? Is it the capability manager? And if so, how? These are, these are the issues I think that are most fundamental and they're the things that if we're not careful, there's a whole pile of things that have been there that have synthesised over the last 40, 50 years that if we just wave our hand at it, they'll just fall down through the cracks and we'll go backwards, not forwards. But as I say, I don't know, I'm as ill-informed as anyone else. It's a change management process which is being kept very, very carefully um, at, a, at a layer and I don't, know, I don't know anyone who knows despite buying lots of people lots of beers. So if you need beers, let me, let me know. 
So I, I don't think the answer is nobody knows. And that, and that for me is a little scary. Uh, the Q and A. We've got a television program here, so very controversial at the moment for uh, for allowing a, a, a very uh, outspoken um, uh, Islamic extremist on a national television the other night. But <laughs> one of the traditions there is that to invoke the comment rather than the question. And I'm going to I'm going to comment now, Ben, rather than question. Um, we uh, uh, we have sat back for a while, hoping that. Uh, the US, who in most cases are, are significantly advanced in, in digital integration ahead of us, that if we kind of held our breath that they would magically start to align around a single um, set of systems. And of course the US is big enough to achieve economy of scale in four different service systems. So our Air Force, who predominantly buy US Navy aircraft, um, it's not surprising that they achieve a level of integration because they are a customer in foreign military sales terms of one of those of four systems. Um, we have not been afforded that uh, opportunity uh, and so that's something we need to understand. Um, we've bought into an Israeli battle management system that again in Israel is a single ecosystem. Every uh, platform is part of and designed to be part of that system. So. The, the fact that we have a separate battle management system fires isn't an indication that our battle man, Israeli battle management system isn't capable of doing that. It has a fires module. We just don't turn it on. So what we uh, have to understand is that notion of what philosophy or what system that we are uh, able to or allowed to buy into. Now, having said that, in all likelihood, we'll procure a vehicle under Land 400 that... that you know, we, we actually are going to go for that common vehicle architecture approach because it could come from any number of, uh, of, of European countries. So, uh, any number of countries, not, not uh, necessarily European. So, um, it is an issue, it is a, a problem for us. We hoped that integration might be solved ahead of us. It hasn't, so uh, we are in, not in the enviable position that our Air Force find ourselves. Um, but we are significantly more aware now um, of, of, after a good number of years on this journey, that what, what we need to be asking for. And, and you've, you've been accurate in describing Tiger as a very significantly realised capability, um, but it will forever fly around with a Eurogrid command and control system that will not be compatible with, uh, with our battle management system. So that, that's a fact. So, so your summary is accurate. We know where we're at. We're just got trying to work out how to get out of this spot with this bog we're in. Well, I hope nobody's head rolls for giving you a microphone, Gus, but thank you. <laughs> so next on my list. Uh, Kim Gilfill, I work in Army Headquarters. So I, I guess my question stems from uh, Dr Davies' presentation, but also the subsequent discussion. Uh, so I think with the, uh, the, the Tiger and the MH, MRH projects, we saw it an off-the-shelf capability, but that didn't turn out to be true. But what we were seeking by talking about off the shelf was to reduce the risk that we were exposed to in the, uh, in the acquisition. But in both cases, uh, what it turned out was that the timing that we went to market, there wasn't really a lot of options there for us to, uh, to acquire that were true, what you've talked about as FMS cases from the, uh, from the US. So I think the crux of the question is how do we align our need going forward into the future, which is probably the strategy space that you were talking about. Uh, with funding availability in the DI, DIP uh, when there will actually be production line availability for mature systems with mature support, uh, mature platforms with mature support systems uh, that will reduce the risk that is actually what we're after. Uh, as I said, a lot of the decisions have been made, but there are still future decision points. So it's a matter of horizon scanning very carefully and not buying off the brochure. As you say, there, there, there was was a degree to which we thought the risk was being reduced by chasing those systems, but there was also a very high degree to which um, we looked at something like Apache and said, A, a too expensive, and B, not really absolutely cutting edge. But having said that, if we'd gone and bought Apache back when that decision was made, we would have been operating them for a decade by now, and they would have been providing far more capability than Tiger's been able to deliver up to now. So um, I, I only partially buy into the premise of that question. And that's what I said before, that sometimes better is the enemy of good enough. Sometimes there's something out there that you can buy now that will do most of what you want to do, and that's better than waiting a decade and spending, spending billions of dollars um, getting to something further down the track. Does that make sense?
problem. I think the uh, A model Apache was offered, which uh, is well and truly past its use-by date now. So I don't, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that that would have represented a, uh, a good investment uh, solution for, uh, for us for the, for the life of type that we're looking at. So I, I think the, the, the crux of the question is how, how to align our defence investment plan spend spread with a product that is in the middle of its life that will run us for the, uh, for the duration that we want. Uh, if we, the, you know, the products that were available in uh, 2001 when we went to contract, or 99 when, um, uh, when the project was approved, were the uh, Angusta, which was uh, also developmental and too light, the Tiger, the uh, H1Z, which is still being introduced into service in the Marine Corps, and the A model Apache. And for the MRH project, there was the UH-60 uh, Mike, the MRH and the, and the Merlin. But the Mike was, uh, all of those products were more or less in a developmental state. So the, the, again, the crush of the question is how do we align our needs to the right place in the defence investment plan for when there is actually production availability? That, that's the crux of my question. I, I think consideration of the, uh, of the past mistakes is very useful in identifying that we do need to reduce the, uh, the risk that we're exposed to, that we're not a big enough defence force to accept that level of risk. But the key question is how do we learn from that lesson and make sure that when we come to our next major acquisition that we don't make the same mistake. Sure, and, and there are risks both ways. You can look at something that's in development with an ally now and saying, oh, that'll be good because that's going to be ready eight years from now and that's exactly when we need to replace ours and that eight years becomes 14 years and all of a sudden you've got a problem. Um, but all you can do is horizon scan and try to minimise risks, but don't, um, don't try to... Don't convince yourself that there are less risks in one path than another one. You actually have to as Mike says, do the system engineering, identify exactly the level of maturity of all of the options and then make a considered decision, which I would still argue we didn't do in that case. Quick one, Mike. Yeah, look, I, I, just a comment on that. I, I think one of the issues is really that, that you've got to look at these as a program and therefore the key question to ask is what's the R&D tail that runs with those platforms? So it doesn't matter if it's an Apache or a, uh, or a Matchbox. Um, if, the comp if, the, if there's scale and there's clear investment plans to, to sustain that platform, then you're on a winner because then you've got choice all along. Now, then it's a choice of whether you run the, uh, the, the sort of institutional underinvestment in the leopard tank that, w that the Army the Defence took and it takes it into a cul-de-sac. But I, I think the key question now is when you buy, you buy if you're going to be an FMS or it doesn't matter where you're going to buy, the questions I think you've got to start asking yourself is, is there scale in the production? And if there is scale in the production, is there a clear pathway for R&D on the platform? Um, because we don't, I mean, Australia doesn't have that scale. Now, if you can answer both those questions positively, then, it's, then, then you're going to probably be in a position where you think the platform's going to have a life. And acquisition's only part of the story. As I said with the Bravo Seahawks, you know, there's plenty of Bravo Seahawks flying around the world, but none of them looked like ours. So it's, it's a matter of aligning acquisition, but also aligning onboard systems and um, keeping to that baseline. You know, Air Force could, with Air Force's Super Hornets, if they don't follow the US Navy um, as, as progressive upgrades occur, they'll end up in the same situation. They'll end up with orphan Super Hornets. Now, I think they know better than to do that, but, but that error is always there to be made. I have time for one last question, yes, in the back. Yeah, um, I did a lot of capability development for New Zealand when I was serving, and I like the systems approach, but the problem we have is we know we want to do something, but we don't know what's out there. How can you define a system if you don't know what's out there to define? Um, well, you see, you're already on a hiding to nothing. That's like saying I'm going on holiday, I don't know where I'm going, but let me pack anyway. I think if, it, if you don't know what's out there, you're not a smart customer. You have to know what's out there. Uh, you are the system designer. You're going to write a system spec to buy something which defines what you're going to buy. You but must we, know what's out there. No, but we are buying an effect, and we don't know everything out there that can achieve that effect, so how can we design the system around it? 
then, then you, to me, you either have to do one or two things. You have to back right back up to the top and engage somebody who knows about such things and allow them to do that for you, or, or to move forward and become a little better informed and, and write, write the statements understanding what is out there. Because if you click your fingers in a contract, it'll turn up in five minutes. There is nothing that is going to magically appear during the period of contract as some new technology. It's either there or it's not. And it's either there with a logistics tail or not. And so depending on your requirements, you should easily be able to find it. Or have an offer definition activity or, or I'm not sure why it wouldn't be there, if you know what I mean, or not know that it's not there. Or, or, or do things iteratively. Say, OK, here's the effect we're after. You put out a, a RFI, get industry to come back and tell you how they'll meet that effect. And then you say, OK, well, now I know what the range of possibilities looks like. How much of that do I need? How much am I prepared to spend to get it? Well, gentlemen, again, um, thank you very, very much uh, for, for fant fantastic uh, presentations. And thanks, all of you, um, for contributing to the um, debate. And please join me in thanking our panellists.